Welcome to this week's episode of the Strange Catholic Show. This week, we'll have Bob's first cup. Our main topic is going to be talking about our sphere of influence. Our saint this week is the golden tongue, tongue saint, St. John Chrysostom. For opening prayer, we'll turn it over to Terry. All right. Thanks, Phil. Good evening, brothers. Good evening, podcast listeners. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious and Heavenly Father, as we begin yet another podcast episode, we just pray that the Holy Spirit descend down upon each and every one of us and give us, Heavenly Father, the words that you seek to let the world know your light and your love. And we pray all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Over to you, Phil. Hey, Bob, what do you got for our first cup? Hey, I'm uh, reading a book right now on radical hospitality. For a class I'm in, um, maybe some of the students are podcast listeners. I doubt it, but if they are, they'll at least know what I'm talking about. You got to tell them about it. That's the first step. (laughs) (laughs) Tell us more. Tell us more. It's interesting. uh, At least uh, the first few chapters that I've been getting through about talking about monks. And I think this is something that we need to dive deeper into in a future podcast is talking more about monks and their tradition and some more specifics about their their uh, kind of what they're called to in regards to hospitality it was just very interesting to see how how even though they're these kind of these quiet solemn not solemn but quiet you know they're 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 together as a as a group of brothers or sisters of its nuns, and uh, you know they live together, they interact, you know, and they pray together, and, and it's a big thing. But also the part about just welcoming people from a hospitality standpoint, with like no questions asked, and you know they're just the most welcoming groups of group of people on the face of the earth. It was very just interesting, you know, and I. We've talked about St. Benedict, and this is the Benedictine tradition, but, um, you know, so it's mostly Benedictine monks but, that I'm not reading about, but I just think we should probably dive deeper if we haven't already, because I can't remember every podcast we've done, and talk more about the Benedictine tradition and Benedictine monks. So that's just kind of mostly what I'm thinking about this week. Just got back from Myrtle Beach, so I was trying to vacation a little bit. So did get an opportunity to go to another Catholic church down in the Myrtle Beach, South Carolina area. So that was a wonderful experience. So maybe we'll have to do a check out this church in the, in the near future. That sounds great. Yeah, no, I mean, we have not gone into detail on the Benedictine tradition. Um, I know we've highlighted St. Benedict, or at least we've spoken about his rule, the rule of St. Benedict, Um, his amazing influence on all of West, West, the Western Hemisphere, really, Um, Europe, North and South America, Central America, you know, just that impact that he's had. And, And it's not limited there but just the resurgence of when there is one civilization that is kind of crumbling and falling down. St. Benedict was there to kind of give some direction and some guidance. Um, So we'll definitely have to pick up St. Benedict again and the Benedictine rule. Uh, Terry and I and yourself have all attended a Benedictine university, so we'll have some perspectives. I think we've all our our lives have all been transformed in many ways by the witness of the monks that we have encountered 
um, and ju and just yeah. So there's a lot there that we could unpack, but to keep it high level, uh, the hospitality. This was something we often had in our spiritual companioning. Was that first chapter of hospitality when we would um, <clears throat> wax so eloquently on the need for hospitality, and it, I just. I'm brought back to some very fond memories at Caribou Coffee talking about hospitality and um, just those lively discussions that we had about hospitality. So obviously we want to be welcoming, right? That's part of what hospitality. We want to provide that warmth, that love, that embrace that Christ gives to each and every individual. We want to provide that in our service of others. So that's probably all I want to say about hospitality. What do you got, Terry? Hospitality, as a church, I think, uh, in my opinion, maybe we could do a little bit better job of hospitality, uh, especially after having experienced what we experienced through the uh, lovely Benedictine monks at uh, St. John's University. Uh, such a joy. Yes, Phil is... The benefit of, of subscribing to the YouTube channel is that you could now see Phil holding up our journals from our years of spiritual companioning. So thank you, Phil. But uh, what, uh, you know, and I know there are other, um, the word is escaping me right now, other orders. There we go. That's the word I'm trying to search for. Um, that do include hospitality as part of their order, uh, obviously to attract more people into their order, but uh, it's kind of the cornerstone for the Benedictine tradition. So, Bob, I would agree with you. We could uh, maybe do a little bit deeper dive into that going forward, but it was really uh, wonderful uh, being in class and getting to meet these fine men who were uh, Benedict and women too. There were some Benedictine nuns that we encountered as well. Um, and all of them, not a single one of them did not exude. There you go. There you go, Phil. Did not exude uh, hospitality and that sense of welcoming wherever they were at. That's all I got. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. So I just think, you know, we need to think more about what hospitality is and what radical hospitality is and how we accept people uh, in the world. So I think it's something we can go deeper in. I just wanted to tease it a little bit in the first segment tonight and uh, we can move on from there. Let's move on to the main topic with Bill. Take it away. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I, I have many uh, memories of hospitality. Uh, some of the stories we would read, some of the specific authors. One second. Uh, excuse me one second while I grab a small child who has woken up. So we're going to take a pause. This is the part of the show where we would hum or play old music, but or that type of thing. But we don't have that. We're too low budget. <laughs> well, you and I could do the think theme from a game show that we both know of, but then we'd probably have to pay a royalty to that game show. So that probably wouldn't work out so well. Yeah, right. Yeah, we don't have that kind of. We don't have that kind of budget, but, me. Right. Yeah. But if you'd like to advertise on our podcast, please get in touch with Phil. StrangeCatholicsPod at gmail dot com. <laughs> okay, totally uh, back on topic now, right? Totally. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about was our sphere of influence. Last week we talked about distractions and how we. In many cases, I would say, if not all of us 
most of us have allowed distractions to really seep into our lives and that we've allowed these distractions to kind of take root, take hold and pull our focus away from God. So the next kind of phase, and I'm totally stealing this from Father Mike Schmitz. If you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, he's more than welcome. Um, but stealing that sphere of influence from Father Mike Schmitz in that we don't have the ability to likely change something that's happening all the way across the world, right? Usually our sphere of influence is far more local to where we are. Now, maybe in our professional lives, maybe we have that ability or we have a way that we can have an impact. We know that our prayers are real and are powerful. And so we can offer prayers for those that are suffering all across the world as we do. But when we think about sphere of influence, more of it is who do we interact with regularly? Who do we come in contact with? And who do we actually have the ability to help change hearts and minds to Christ? So it's not about what we see on even the local news, what we see on the national news, what we maybe listen to on some other podcast, not ours, but another podcast maybe, what we watch on YouTube, you know, something maybe was we're just kind of edging out on Netflix or whatever it might be. You know, we, we just kind of fall into that and we think, oh, you know, but again, our sphere of influence, what actually do we have influence where we can have that positive impact of Christ in the, those that we interact with regularly? And then who are those that are outside of our sphere that maybe we want to be able to have an impact? And some of the things they say they do cause us uh, consternation, right? Where we struggle with some of the things they do, they say, whatever it might be. So focusing on our sphere of influence, not our sphere of interest. All of these words stolen from Father Mike Schmitz. Because we may be interested in a lot of different things. We probably don't actually have influence in most of those things, right? And I, I think that's part of our news culture, just even the culture, not just in the United States, but around the world, people are plugged in and watching and listening and consuming media from those that are outside of their sphere of influence. That's just a given, right? We take in information from things that are outside of what we can have an influence on. And so tying into that distraction where we get pulled away, again, this is that another way that we can easily get pulled away by whatever the thing might be, or the person, or the movement, or whatever it might be, where we don't actually have this, the influence to make that positive change to turn more hearts and minds to Christ. So when we reflect on what is our sphere of influence, it should be those that's not just within our interest, things that we're intrigued by, things we're passionate about, right? It's more who do are those that we interact with regularly? Where might we inter in interact with or encounter someone? And how can we bring that soul ever closer to Christ? So that that's kind of the the very quick synopsis of the sphere of influence versus the sphere of interest, because we have a lot of interests, but we have far less people that we can actually influence. I, I can't personally influence uh, the Dalai Lama, the President of the United States, even our Holy Father, Pope Francis. I don't have like a direct line to Pope Francis, right? So maybe if I don't like something he said, I can pray about that, see why I don't like that. But it doesn't mean that I'm up in arms and I'm on, you know, the YouTubes that you guys are all subscribing to for our channel. But Again, focusing on our sphere of influence and keeping it as small. And this, uh, many popes have written about this, that subsidiarity, right, where we're staying focused as small as we can. We don't look to the big government or even a worldwide power. Instead, we're trying to stay as local as possible so that then the people of the area are able to speak that voice and bring up some of those concerns that we have, where we do have a sphere of influence. But we probably don't have a sphere of influence in 
say maybe the the federal government. Okay, maybe not all of us. Some do, but not many of us. Or maybe even on our state government, maybe we don't even have the ability to kind of get get a you know a bug in the ear of a legislator. We can send notes, we can send emails, we can call, but it, usually our sphere of influence is going to be even smaller than that. So it's it's just trying to refocus us because we can get so distracted by what's happening in our state, our country, our world that we get distracted by our sphere of interest where we actually should be focusing on our sphere of influence. Those within our sphere of influence that we can really have that positive impact of how Christ has changed us, how he has radically transformed our lives by his love and his mercy, and sharing that with other people. What do you got, Terry? Well, our sphere of influence could include our podcast listeners because Indeed. You know, Indeed. we have we can have some influence on them by sharing our faith. And I think, you know, that's kind of one of the underlying principles of of why exactly that we do this. Right. Absolutely. But I think for us, uh, for the two of us, Phil and I, as uh, ordained deacons of the church, we have to carefully tread with our sphere of influence and making sure that we are bringing people to Christ and breaking open that word for our sphere of influence um, instead of, you know, turning people away from Christ or distracting people away from Christ. The way that we have talked about with some of those of uh, the presbyterate, uh, on on previous podcasts who have uh, allowed more of their opinion to come into that conversation. And something I think that uh, we all need to be aware of, 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 you know, who is our sphere of influence? Obviously, as dads, the three of us, you know, we have uh, a sphere of influence somewhat, to, uh, for our kids at least uh, when they're young at least when they're young once they uh turn about 12 or 13 they then maybe not as much <laughs> but um we can still try to influence them guide them but you know we all know from our experiences that Kids will make their own decisions, but doesn't mean that we can't continue to uh, still influence them and live our lives as Christ would ask us to, and let our life be the words that Christ gives us to those around us. And I mean, uh, so many times with our kids, it's the wise, right? When we tell them, don't do this or that you need to do this or something. If we can attach a why to it, and this is same truth, like if we've done a youth group or whatever at our local parish, same thing. If we can attach a why, the reason why we might do something, this or that or whatever it might be, if we can attach a why to it, it usually has a much greater impact. At least that's the experience I've uh, I've seen. So, you know, again, our sphere of influence can vary. Uh, per person, and it's it, again, it's reflecting as as Terry mentioned. You know, it's drawing in, and and who are those that I really actually can draw into a even greater, closer relationship with Jesus Christ? So, what do you got, Bob? Well, I think the only thing I want to add to this conversation is you got to pick your battles, right? Um, Amen. You gotta, you gotta assess the landscape, and then you gotta determine, okay, you know, where you're gonna get the biggest bang for your buck in regards to, uh, you know, where you want to use your most influence that you do have. So um, sometimes you can try to use a whole lot of influence in an area or, or 
try to use what you feel is a lot of influence or a lot of capital in a certain area where your influence is not going to be uh, recognized or it's just not going to be that great and that you're going to fall short. So why would you waste that capital there and you would use it where you have more influence? So Indeed. Uh, there's a lot of good books out there to to look at in regards to influence, influencing people and leadership style that I think people can look at and just kind of figure out, you know, the difference between areas of interest and areas of influence. You want to use that capital, that capital that you have, and you want to use it in your area of influence, you know, in your local parish, you know, right. or, or yep. somewhere like that, wherever you would have that, you know, so that I, that's what I would offer. And I deal with this on a daily basis. So uh, in my line of work, there's a lot of people with a lot of who feel they have a lot of influence in certain areas and they don't. And, right. or they're, you know, it's a hierarchical stratified, you know, deal where it's, I know a guy here and I'm going to influence this and so on and so forth. And I, you know what I'm talking about. So, um, so, uh, okay. But, uh, you know, that's all I really have to say on that. I mean, I think it was covered well, but influence is certainly something that I have a lot of experience with, and I would concur with both of you on your comments. Yeah, and I thank, thank you, Bob. Bill. And I, I think it's definitely related to that hospitality that you brought up um, in that if we can't bring that loving presence of Christ to those that we actually have an influence over or with or you know um, working with them to help them see how Christ is loving them ever closer to his sacred heart you know if we if we just jar them with something you know you know, hit them upside the head you know maybe our sphere of influence will shrink because they no longer want anything to do with us so again it's um, in a way I think it definitely relates to that hospitality and how we can bring that message of Christ his mercy, his love, that gift of salvation that he's offering us, that we just have to accept and 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 let him into our lives, which is a radical transformation. I recognize that. Um, so I, I do I do I think I've read that radical hospitality book, but that's an aside. Anyways, um, but you know it's again. I mean, we encounter this in our professional lives, in our personal lives, in our parish ministries that we do this this is a way where you know we um sometimes we get you know we get over our skis maybe as is a, is a good term where we we think we have more influence than we do because of our interests right we all have our own interests so always remembering to be you know just draw ourselves ever closer to that sacred heart of jesus and just reciprocate that mercy and that love to others that we encounter and recognize that hey when we're trying to overstep our skis please you know just ask the lord to just hey draw me back okay if i'm if i'm going beyond where i should if i'm not doing what you want me to do please just bring me back somehow sometimes painful sometimes very embarrassing but just allow it to happen so we can we can be focused in that right area because so many times, you know, depending on the whatever professionally, especially that we have, some people have real, you know, leader from a leadership standpoint or even from a power standpoint, right? They're able to say, well, I'm this person. So you have to do what I say where that maybe they, maybe they have some semblance of power or power in a different place or a different lane even, but they don't have power in that lane. So they think that they can influence that, but they actually can't. So, I mean, I, I know all of us have seen that professionally. So again, it's just, it's whatever we can do to be ever focused on our sphere of influence, witnessing to Christ, his church. Now he's always drawing all of us back ever closer to his sacred heart, ever wanting to just wash over us with his salvation. So. 
that's all I have on that, unless Terry has more comments. Just a big amen for you, brother. Amen. All right, amen to that. And that means that we're going to take a short break and we'll be back right after this. Stay with us. We're back and it's time for Sync Spotlight. Amen to that. Go ahead, Terry. All right, thanks, Bob. And as Phil said in the opening, this week we are featuring St. John Chrysostom. Let me try that again. St. John Chrysostom. His feast day is September 13th. He is the patron saint of epileptics, orators, lecturers, public speakers, preachers, Asola, Italy, Constantinople, and Istanbul, Turkey. If his body was weak, his tongue was powerful. The content of his sermons, his exegesis of scripture, were never without a point. Sometimes the point stung the high and the mighty, and some of his sermons lasted up to two hours. St. John was named Christostom, Golden Mouth, an account of his eloquence. He came into the world of Christian parents about the year 344 in the city of Antioch. John's father, a high-ranking military officer, died when he was young. He was raised by his mother, Anthusia, who at the age of 20 was a model of virtue. He studied rhetoric under Labinius, a pagan, the most famous orator of this age. He grew up in Antioch, received an excellent classical Greek education, and upon meeting the holy bishop Melitus, he decided to devote he decided to devote his time to the study of religious works and sacred scriptures. He received baptism after three years of study and in 374 set out for the desert to live an ascetic life of a hermit. His extreme mortifications left him in fragile health, and he thus returned to Antioch in 386. In that same year, John was ordained and served in the Cathedral of Antioch for 12 years, winning widespread fame for his sublime preaching at the Golden Church. Antioch's cathedral, especially his insightful expositions of Bible passages and moral teachings. The valuable of his works from this period are his homilies on the various books of the Bible. He emphasized charitable giving and was concerned with the spiritual and temporal needs of the poor. He spoke against abuse of wealth and personal property. St. John said, Do you wish to honor the body of Christ? Do not ignore him when he is naked. Do not pay him homage in the temple clad in silk. Only then to neglect him outside where he is cold and ill-clad. Who said, he who said, this is my body, is the same who said, you saw me hungry and you gave me no food. And whatever you did to the least of my brothers, you did also to me. What good is it if the Eucharistic table is overloaded with golden chalices when your brother is dying of hunger? Start by satisfying his hunger and then, with what is left, you may adorn the altar as well. Excellent quote there. In his eloquent, moving, and repeated insistence on almsgiving, he frequently taught that he was that what was not needed for one's reasonable needs ought to be given away. In 398, he was elevated to the see of Constantinople 
and became one of the and became one of the greatest lights of the church. But he also had enemies in high places, and some were ecclesiastics, not the least being Theophilus, patriarch of Alexandria, who repented of this before he died. His most powerful enemy, however, was the emperor. His most powerful enemy, however, was the Empress Eudoxia, who was offended by the apostolic freedom of his discourses. In 403, Theophilus convened a synod of disaffected or subservient Syrian and Egyptian bishops. This gathering indicted John on a large number of charges, many of which were purely frivolous. John refused to appear before the synod, whereupon it condemned him and professed to depose him from his see. The emperor Arcadius therefore banished him from the city, recalled him at once, and then finally banished him again the following year. He was kept in confinement in Armenia. John appealed his banishment to the Bishop of Rome, Pope Innocent I. In exile, however, John found it possible to keep a lively correspondence with his supporters and was still able to exert a measure of influence in his cause. He was to be removed to an even more remote place at the eastern end of the Black Sea, but he did not survive the exhausting journey. He died during the journey on September 14th in 407 in Pontus, his ill health unable to endure its rigors. He was canonized pre-congregation, meaning that he was canonized prior to the institution of the modern investigations performed by the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. It designates that those beati who were canonized by local bishops, primates, or patriarchs, often as a result of popular devotion. And one last quote from St. John from paragraph 2179 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, you cannot pray at home as a church where there is a great multitude, where exclamations are cried out to God as from one great heart, and where there is something more, the union of minds, the accord of souls, the bond of charity, the prayers of the priests. And that is St. John Christosom. St. John, pray for us. Pray for us. <clears throat> Pray for us. A beautiful tidbit about St. John Chrysostom is that he is also the author of the Divine Liturgy. So for our Eastern Rite Catholics, he, he wrote the liturgy that the Eastern Rite Catholics are still following today. So we're Latin Rite Catholics, Terry, Bob, and myself. So the Eastern Rites, the Byzantine specifically, because I know about that, but Eastern Rite Catholics are going to be following many of them the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. So remarkable influence that he had. Again, great persecutions, but he recognized where he could have an impact. All tied in with our main topic. Beautiful. Beautiful saint. It also in his uh, circle of influence, right? Right. And a name difficult to say. Yes. Yes. For some of us, anyway. Chrysostom or Chrysostom, I've heard both. Okay. All right. Well, it's time for that part of the broadcast that we, where we try to pronounce correctly uh, Sorry, I just had a glitch there. And maybe is a glitch in what I was saying or a glitch in my technology, but I guess what I was trying to get is the time for, for you to talk back to us, the listeners, 
we, we want to to hear your comments. We want you to tell us uh, what you think about our show and what ideas you have for future shows. We also want you to give us your prayer intentions to because we want to pray with you and for you about you in all different ways. We're here to pray as a community. We, we also want you to rate us on your podcast platform. Please rate us five. You, you don't have to be from the year 368. You, you can be from this current year and you can rate us. Uh, you don't have to be Saint, uh, Saint, be able to pronounce St. John Christostom because I can't. So, but, but please rate us uh, five if you can. Uh, there's lots of ways to get in touch with us, but the best way to get in touch with us with comments is that strangecatholicspod at gmail.com. You can also leave us a voice message at anchor.fm forward slash strange Catholics. And please remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can take in a lot more of the visual elements of our show on YouTube. A link is in the description. Right. And just for this week alone, I will make this challenge. It's sort of like a public television challenge. If we can get another 10 YouTube listeners Let's try that again. Another 10 YouTube subscribers to watch us over the next uh, next week before we do the next podcast. I, I will guarantee that I will be on video next week. Let's just put it that way. I like that challenge. Is, how, is that a bad, is that a good challenge? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Getting Let's try and night, entice so, them. You know, it is. It's very late. <laughs> All right, so it's time for closing prayer, and uh, Phil's going to do closing prayer. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bring before you all these prayers and petitions that we hold in our hearts, those that are listening now, and our own intentions. We pray for the protection of life from conception until natural death. We pray also for Jessica's baby and for all newborn babies. We pray for healing for Joanne and all those that are experiencing any anxiety because of COVID or any other illness. Pray for all those that are struggling in their marriages, all that need to draw ever deeper from that well of grace you offer us in the sacrament of holy matrimony. Pray for all those that have been affected by storms in our country and around the world that you give them and those that are trying to help them the strength and the peace and the love of christ we pray also for all those that might be feeling abandoned isolated around the world but especially in afghanistan that there be continued outpouring of the holy spirit to draw ever more souls to safety to your peace, to your church. Pray also for all of those that are struggling, whatever it might be, mentally, physically, emotionally, or spiritually, that you bless them, help them to feel that touch of that only the divine physician can offer. Grant them the peace and serenity we offer all of these things in accordance with your will. And as we pray, O oh God, strength of those who hope in you, who will that the Bishop St. John Chrysostom should be illustrious by his wonderful eloquence and his experience of suffering, grant us, we pray, that instructed by his teachings, we may be strengthened through the example of his invincible patience through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks a lot, folks, for joining us this week. Look forward to talking to you next week. Until then, Love you, brothers. Love you, brothers. Love you, brothers.